there is definitely people out there that want virtual and only virtual love lives and then there's people who want to bring the virtual world into their real world. So I think we're at a bit of a turning point with sex tech. In the digital era, platforms like Tinder and other online dating sites have certainly seen us commodifying sex. And suddenly, when you're using a device and you're connecting it through the internet and you're storing data, you can get an idea of people's behaviours um, around a topic that has been closed forever. There are definitely commercial opportunities here for people who are brave enough to move away from the schemas that we've had around, for instance, just pornography. That's the power of socially acceptable, socially shareable sex. People have been using technology to enhance sex for millennia. And this type of innovation doesn't just affect pleasure. Revolutionary breakthroughs like the contraceptive pill have had a massive impact on culture and on business. And we're now seeing digital technologies that could be just as disruptive. They could replace real life lovers, redefine relationships and provide serious opportunities for investors. The future of sex may be closer than you think. Thanks to the rise of virtual reality headsets like Oculus Rift, we're starting to see the emergence of VR porn, which is a lot more immersive. You're starting to feel like you're actually in the porn film rather than just watching it. And when you combine that with sort of connected sex toys that sort of line up to the movements happening within the environment, uh, it can start to feel a lot more real. The capacity to create a really immersive sexual experience is humongous right now. And that experience doesn't just have to be within the realms of what's physically possible, it can be completely fantastical as well. People can make their craziest fantasies totally all-consuming. We already have a few crude sex robots which are basically sex dolls with Siri and a sort of a gyration system in them. But we're going to start seeing ones which are very realistic and perhaps can have a sort of uh, connection on an emotional level as well as a physical one. There is the possibility that we could start seeking solace in digital um, characters, artificial intelligence that we've sort of seen in films like Her, and that potentially could mean we're moving away from human interaction, but it could be a different kind of intimacy. So, while VR and AI are threatening to suck some of us into a virtual vortex, there's another side to sex tech, one that's all about enhancing real-life relationships. I spoke with Kiru, a company that's transforming the way that we have sex online. Hey, Alex, thank you for coming to uh, speak with us at the Drum today from Amsterdam. Do you want to just kind of talk us through what Kiru is, how it works? We're a company that have tried to improve and develop teledildonics. That's what they're commonly known as, but other people call them cyberdildonics or remote pleasure products. Okay. Um, so they're vibrators and masturbators that you can share feeling with through the internet, send feeling. Can we have a look, see how it works? Yeah, sure. Put your hand inside and you'll be able to feel the rings okay. as I go up and down with the product. So you go up and then down. That feels really weird. In and then that'll be out and in and out and you go faster. It's really cool states, isn't it? Like yeah. you can... And go right. It also vibrates, so I'm not going to put it on vibrate at the moment. Right, but... so it can like a double... Yeah. <laughs> so the female gets to pleasure herself and vibrate as normal, uh -huh. but then she can actually feel because there's rings underneath. Oh, so that it feels on that as well yeah. as in here. Yeah. We really want to normalise sex online. Um, cyber sex, that word, is usually related to bad things that happen with like, underage girls on MSN Messenger and things like that. But it doesn't have to be bad. It's like digital love or sharing pleasure online with each other can be safe and can be secure. We're trying to normalise that and bring it to everybody so that they can socialise, you can share feeling online and go further than the screen so that no matter where you are worldwide, you can actually enjoy sexual pleasure. Long distance relationships are actually more normal nowadays, but undeniably they're still really hard. So we're trying to bring people back together using technology. And moving forward, we're looking to develop the, the full picture where you can go online and meet multiple people, maybe even have fun with multiple people at once because the products can do that. 
a lot of uh, webcam companies are industry, uh, interested, like uh, webcam performers online, because for them it's a big opportunity for them to use the device and stimulate their customers internationally. You don't really have to go to somebody else to have the experience, right? In terms of the take-up, um, it is definitely where the industry is going. Uh, if you look at uh, the way the social behaviour is going, it's all going sort of social and, and online and, and internet related. And this never existed, shall we say, even 18 months ago. So this is a whole new breed of products that are coming into the market that are looking to, to capitalise on, on the human nature that is becoming ever more online. Whatever kind of sex you're getting involved in, one of the key components to making it work has to be trust. So whether that's, you know, offline sex where nothing is sort of introduced in way of tech or whether it's a Skype uh, session or teledildonics, um, there are two key things that we have to look at. So the first is how, how much do you trust the person that you're interacting with or people that you're interacting with? And the second is how much do you trust the technology that's mediating or facilitating that interaction? So it's not uncommon for things to get hacked. Uh, and we're going to have to start thinking about ways of addressing the issue of trust, of consent, and then making sure that it's as difficult as possible for things to get hacked. With all this progress being made in sex tech, I will be intrigued to see how the law is affected in future because so many people are sharing information pertaining to their sexuality and their sexual interests. There's a lot of information that couples are sharing that could then be uh, kept or recorded perhaps after those relationships finish. There are so many moral and legal pitfalls potentially here. I mean, it's a fascinating subject, but also one which, with regards to legislation, is going to be very interesting to observe. Security concerns aside, these toys are presenting a new, classier vision of online sex, and they wouldn't even look out of place in the Apple Store. But the internet has already revolutionised sexual connections in a more fundamental way. I'm talking about hookup apps. They may only have been on the scene for a few years, but the impact they've had has already been massive. So one of the things we're finding with hookup apps is that it's starting to normalise behaviours that were previously taboo. So for instance, if you're a woman and you were wanting to engage in fantastic consensual hookup sex, previously it was very difficult to do and there'd be a lot of stigma attached to that. Um, and now with the advent of all these different hookup apps, it's a lot easier to do it in a way that's safe and in a way that's not stigmatised. So it's really not uncommon for someone who's single to pull out their app and, and be showing it to a group of friends at a table, whereas before, still, even in this day and age, um, a lot of dating was done sort of behind closed doors. It's difficult to have someone like that in the street that we've never seen. The first step? No, certainly not. We don't know what the person will think. It's difficult, yeah. No matter how obscure your interests or how remote your location geographically, Online dating services and dating apps have made it more likely than ever before that you can easily find someone that you'll connect with. They have completely changed the landscape of dating. In some ways they sort of demystify a lot of the chase part of trying to find a suitable partner, um, even if it's just for a one night stand. But on the other hand, they do open up this whole world of possibilities of people you would have never otherwise come across you know, if you weren't in that bar at that time. In the digital era, platforms like Tinder and other online dating sites have certainly seen us commodifying sex. Um, we are using menus to find like-minded partners. Um, we're interacting and meeting up with people in a different way. That means a date. Not like just going around with the crowd. Just me and the girl. How do you choose a date? Whose company would you enjoy? No fats, no femmes, no Asians. Oh, hell no. Queen, please. Really? Yeah. What? One of the moves that we've seen really recently is one towards transparency and greater um, authenticity. So, so showing the world who you are, including your gender or your sexuality, your relationship style. And this is evident in all the options that you now have on mainstream platforms, for instance, like Facebook. A lot of us are more open about discussing our sex lives. Um, there's more access to education. But then some would maybe argue that we're perhaps oversharing a little bit as well and becoming too reliant on technology. I think what some of these 
apps and products are doing is they're sort of slowly chipping away at that sort of cultural prudishness that we have about sex and pre presenting it in a way that's more accessible to a wider range of, of people. I do think this is part of a broader cultural shift for people to be more accepting of perhaps more adventurous sexual practices, um, which I think is typified by the Fifty Shades of Grey effect, where we're seeing high street uh, retailers and supermarkets starting to stock things like bondage gear. One of the things that we've also started to see is that this kind of normalisation and branching out to adopt new sexual behaviours and reflect new preferences, that this is, I guess, both leading and reflecting a trend towards more fluid relationship and sexuality preferences. Up until now, most of the conversations around tech and fidelity have centred around things like porn, whether you watch it, whether you don't, um, whether you've got a Skype lover or whatever it might be. But we're moving into this period in which creation of the creation of teledildonics and um, usable devices that you can wear across long distances and still connect it's going to raise a lot of questions about what fidelity actually means if you strap yourself up to something and you're making out with someone across the other end of the world does that still constitute cheating and how will we negotiate these new technologically advanced boundaries i think we're going to be really challenged seeing new generations coming up who are immersed in this world of availability and option uh, in terms of how they conduct their relationships and the expectations we place upon them. If you can imagine having a massive buffet worth of options when you're growing up and that becomes your norm, and then someone comes along and says, oh no, but you, you can only pick from this part of it, it's gonna be really difficult to rein that behavior in. So, as technology gives us more access to sex, it could force us to reassess our own boundaries and desires. And as tech gets ever more entwined with our sex lives, it's revealing some interesting insights about what we're really getting up to. So in the 20th century, Alfred Kinsey conducted still what is the most ambitious sex survey ever known when he interviewed over 18,000 people across America about their sex lives and, and collected a huge amount of detail about individual variation. Um, but what we can look forward to in the 21st century is the use of big data, really huge data sets to help inform and enlighten us about what's really taking place in the bedroom. When you're connected to, to digital devices, you can start recording stuff and taking information back around something that I guess uh, has never been recorded. You know, these are closed bedrooms, these are closed doors. And suddenly, when you're using a device and you're connecting it through the internet and you're storing data, you can get an idea of people's behaviours um, around a topic that, that has been closed forever. <laughs> This data isn't just interesting, it's also valuable for business. One company making use of data is Ashley Madison, the controversial dating platform that's helping married people have affairs. Ashley Madison's user data is shedding light on something that's secreted by definition and reassuring founder Noel Biderman that his company is worth investing in. You know, my legacy is, is yet to be written, right? What is Ashley Madison going to tell us? Well, I would suggest that the big data that we possess on infidelity, 25,000 people signing up a day, self-publishing, we're a fly on the wall watching millions of communications happen, we might actually reveal the truisms behind how monogamous or non-monogamous we are as a society. Researchers today, great anthropologists, sociologists, can't really tell you much about infidelity because those cheating amongst us don't raise their hands. They don't wear those mm -hmm. credit letters. We don't really know how prolific it is. And it turns out that controversy is a really interesting place to make a business bet. Why? Because a lot of times there's a lot of pent up demand, right? I'm sure when the bikini came to market or the pill, they were very mm -hmm. controversial, but a lot of people rushed to wear them or use that product, right? But then a lot of organizations aren't set up to operate within controversy, right? They have very traditional brands or traditional investors behind them. And so controversy not only has pent up demand from a marketplace so you can be successful as an entrepreneur, then the typical competitor may not saddle up to compete with you because their organization is just not willing to venture into controversy until it turns the corner and becomes less controversial. AshleyMadison.com, bringing your marriage back to life. So, technology is leading us into a brave new world of sex, one with fully immersive fantasy porn, lots of casual hookups, long distance loving, and plenty of opportunities for entrepreneurs. Cindy Gallup, sex tech pioneer and founder of Make Love Not Porn, believes sex tech could change all of our lives for the better. 
but only if we escape the trappings of porn and bring real world sex into the open. So in an era where hardcore porn is more freely and widely available on the internet than ever before, and where kids are therefore able to access it at a younger and younger age than ever before. There is an entire generation growing up that believes that what you see in hardcore pornography is the way that you have sex. When I encounter this, I have no problem realizing that a certain amount of re-education, rehabilitation and reorientation has to take place. To get a better sense of where the sex tech industry is heading, we asked indeed what opportunities there are for business. The first step is obviously the money made out of sex. We all have it, we all enjoy it, recession proof, market never goes away. But the second area is, oh my God, the money we made out of socially acceptable sex. You potentially double, triple, quadruple your returns when you normalize people feeling really okay about publicly buying into your goods and services, publicly doing what they do with everything else, which is advocate, share, recommend, and publicly badging themselves as brand ambassadors. That's the billion dollar future that we're going after. That's the power of socially acceptable, socially shareable sex. So I am launching at TED today, I am unveiling makelovenotporn.com. This is a website that posts the myths of hardcore porn and balances them with the reality. Make Love Not Porn is trying to do something extraordinary. Actually, we're trying to do something nobody believes we can do. We're not porn, we're not amateur, we're real world sex. We're creating a whole new category. So we stop the video a lot and we move around the bed and <laughs> we laugh and toys turn on. Do we have sex at all? We have sex. Um... But the adult industry is highly regulated. Sex tech entrepreneurs often find serious barriers between their ideas and the investment that they need. My team and I fight a battle every single day to build Make Love Not Porn, essentially because every piece of business infrastructure any other startup can at least take for granted, we can't because the small print always says no adult content. That is true for every single sex tech venture, and it's an all-pervasive problem in ways that people who don't work in this sector really don't understand. PayPal won't work with us, Amazon won't, mainstream credit card processors won't. There, there are so many opportunities, um, but they will not be realized until the no adult content clause comes out of the business conditions, and until investors are prepared to fund um, these sorts of ventures in a way that I can tell you from personal experience, they're absolutely not at the moment. While selling sex may be tricky for entrepreneurs, using sex to sell is something that's been done for decades. Advertisers are always looking for platforms with large audiences, so it's no surprise that early 2015 saw ads appearing on apps including Happen and Tinder. We spoke with Mark Lewis, Dean of the UK's most awarded ad school, to find out how brands might make steps into sex tech. I remember in the 1990s, very early 1990s, there was, I think, one, maybe two mass broadcasters, ITV and Channel 4. Well, now it's 2015, and now there are, there's been an explosion of channels, not just TV channels, but channels like Tinder. And so we now live in a world of micro-tribes and niches. Uh, and as long as we are relevant and charming, we can do anything. I mean, I've given some examples, I'll give some examples of Tinder that come out of studio this year. Uh, we had a thought about Gillette for it for a brief. Put the beer to do on Tinder, put the non beer to do on Tinder, find out who gets the most swipes most likely to get laid. There's a thought for Tinder. So as long as it's relevant for the channel, yes, absolutely. And, and as long as it's intelligent, yes, absolutely. We can then bring this, this idea of sex into the channel in an interesting, disruptive, relevant way. So I think we're at a bit of a turning point with sex tech. So the demand for sex tech is not going to go away anytime soon. Sex tech is happening and on a grand scale. Every other big bet ever made in the history of tech pales against sex tech. Uh, the commercial opportunity within sex toys has, has, has rocketed. In this sense, sex really will start to sell a bit more. The future of sex tech won't happen unless people like me and other sex tech entrepreneurs make it happen. This is an area of possibilities and challenges. On one hand, we have exciting business opportunities, but on the other, timid investors 
and tight regulations. On a social level, technologies are making sex of all kinds more available and challenging taboos in the process. If these social and corporate barriers are relaxed, sex tech could bring a revolution to the bedroom and to the boardroom. Sex tech is on its way. The question is how far are you willing to go?